morning, everyone, and welcome to First Congregational Church of Concord's online worship service. We're so grateful to have you all here with us this morning, and we hope this service of worship provides a space of peace for you in this time. Just a couple of announcements as we begin. Uh, the first is I just want to give a big thank you to everyone um, who made the worship happen last week um, with my not being able to sit up. Thank you to everyone for your cards and your calls and all of your prayers. I am feeling much better and I am at that point where I also need to be careful because <laughs> I could easily overdo it and that's not what I want to be doing right now. So thank you all very, very much. Deeply appreciative. Um, following worship this morning, we will have our virtual coffee hour and everyone is invited to stay who would like and be in conversation. And just a reminder that you don't need to log off um, in order to participate. You can just leave it on and we'll take a five to 10 minute break and then we'll come back together for a conversation. Um, just a couple notes into the future. We will be having an Ash Wednesday service on Zoom, which is February 17th. Um, we will be having it at 4 p.m. Li live on Zoom. And then if you would, if that doesn't, time doesn't work for you, I will be turning the recording around immediately following. And so we invite you to watch it anytime that evening or the next day that you'd like to watch the Ash Wednesday service. Um, and that will kick off our Lenten season together. So we invite you to participate in that as you can and desire. And with that, I'm now going to share um, a video from our conference minister that I wanted to share last week. Um, it's a, a video of gratitude from Gordon Rankin, Reverend Gordon Rankin, our conference minister. Greetings, First Congregational Church in Concord. For those who do not know me, I am the Reverend Gordon Rankin, Conference Minister of the New Hampshire Conference of the United Church of Christ, whom you have called to serve among you. Today, my heart is filled with gratitude for all the ways in which your church community has given to support our church's wider mission, often referred to as OCWM. Your OCWM basic support giving of $3,300 and your contributions towards all four of our four national offerings have been combined with the giving of other churches to make vital impact in propagating the work of God here in New Hampshire, in our country and all over the world. Through our national setting, you have given to support global missionaries and global mission partners provided resources for worship and for justice conversations that are utilized by many of our churches. And in 2020, even provided some micro grants to support churches that found themselves in a difficult place due to the pandemic. Through the New Hampshire Conference this past year, you have helped us develop all kinds of resources to support our churches in improvising your way through unexpected pandemic realities to continue our outdoor ministries, even when we were unable to be on site at Horton Center and to help over a dozen of our churches find new pastors, even amidst the ever-changing challenges created by COVID. These ministries that I have described are not just ministries of the United Church of Christ and the New Hampshire Conference. They are ministries of your church. You have helped make them happen. And I hope that you celebrate that they happen in part because of you. So on behalf of not only the United Church of Christ and the New Hampshire Conference, but as well on behalf of the other churches and settings of ministry that your giving has impacted, I say thank you. Thank you for what you have given to support this vital work of God. Blessings to you. And with that, I am going to begin our service of worship with our First People Land Acknowledgement. 
we want to acknowledge that we gather as First Congregational Church on the traditional land of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Abenaki people, and the Penacook people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout a thousand generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards in this land that we inhabit as well. And with that, I invite you to join with me in preparing our hearts and our minds for worship as we listen to our prelude. Adele. Let us now light our Trinity candles. We light a light in the name of the creator who creates life, in the name of the Christ who loves life, and in the name of the spirit who is the fire of life. Let us begin by taking a moment of silence to set our intentions for worship this morning, remembering that an intention is essentially a focus. So in this time, I invite you to choose a focus for yourself for worship. And now I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. I will read all of the text and I invite you to join with me on the bolded print. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. God of all to you we raise this our sacrifice of praise. And let us continue by bringing ourselves into God's presence, saying together, healing Lord, by your goodness, you healed many who were ill, even raising the dead to life. Restore us to new life by healing our hearts, minds, and spirits, so that we may proclaim praise and gratitude for your compassion to all who will hear. In the name of the one who is new life, Jesus the Christ, amen. And I invite you now to join with me in singing our opening hymn. Adele will play through the melody once and then we will sing together. Oh. 
O'er brilliant fields of sparkling snow, the radiant moons unfold. The solemn splendors of the night burn brightly through the cold. Life moves in every pulsing vein, love deepens round the heart. And clearer sounds the angel hymn, good will to all on earth. O oh, you from whose unfathomed law the year in beauty flows, yourself the splendid vision seen in crystal and in rose. The passing days with grace declare, and passing nights proclaim. In ever-changing words of light, the wonder of your name. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite Eleanor Kimball to unmute and share with us our gospel lesson for this morning. Our gospel lesson this morning is from Luke, chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. And this is from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some, some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I do not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. Here ends our reading from the Gospel of Mark. Thank you, Eleanor. And this, we begin our agape feast together, begin by remembering together that this is a table and a space of welcome and all are free to come and to eat. As we gather at this table and to worship, 
we remember these words of our brother Jesus. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. We come to this table hungry and thirsty, seeking to be satisfied. As we gather at this table, we remember these words of our brother Jesus. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. We come to this table weary and burdened, seeking rest. As we gather at this table, we remember that Jesus comes to us in those who are strangers to us, in those who are hungry, in those who are thirsty, and in those needing warmth. We come to this table as strangers in a strange land. We ask with humble confidence that you welcome us into your family, O oh God. And let us share together the prayer of adoration. Living God, you are present in our midst and we praise you. You are tearing down walls of alienation and exclusion. For this, we praise you because in Jesus, you have shown us a way of hospitality, simplicity, prayer, peacemaking, and resistance. Because your spirit makes a new path for us as we struggle to live in the shadow of doubt and fear, weak as we are, you fill us with hope. Lover of our souls, you give us joy and we praise you. Amen. We take joy in this meal where we give our love and our attention to one another and remember that Jesus too is here with us. In the midst of this sacred meal, we set three symbols to remind us of Jesus's promises to us. A candle to remind us that Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit upon us, giving us new life, new power, and new hope. We, filled with his Spirit, bring the presence of God into a broken world. And bread, for Jesus is the bread of life. He nourishes us, and we put our trust in him. Grapes, a reminder of his struggle for justice and peace a reminder of his suffering at the hands of the Roman Empire. He suffers still when the oppressed suffer injury at the hands of the powerful. Jesus is with us in this agape feast. Let us open our hearts to God and to one another and let us share in this feast of love entwined as we are by the Holy Spirit. All things are now ready and I invite you to partake of this agape feast well, I share the uh, choral anthem called God's Son Has Made Me Free, and this is from a choir from one of our sister UCC churches in Minnesota.
lesson this morning is from Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Here ends our Psalter reading. At this time, we are going to shift into sharing our sacred stories about the education wing. And I have several videos to share and uh, backdrops to upload. So we're gonna do this a little sort of one section at a time. And uh, I will invite folks to share um, stories about any of the rooms in the education wing. We don't, it doesn't have to be in order as something strikes you, um, but I'm going to begin by putting up the Stearns room behind me. Yes, Pam? Um, I can actually tell the story of the creation of this, at least from a youth. Um, sure. When I went to this church, uh, when we moved, I was actually meeting in a very old house that would probably be condemned now in this time. Um, and it was in the middle of the um, Christian Ed parking lot. And we were invited, all of the kids and the adults spent a great deal of time thinking about what to put in a time capsule when this um, building was constructed and um, behind the cornerstone um, from the Washington Street entrance to the wing um, is a time capsule from, I'm guessing, well, we moved here in 65, so I don't remember exactly what, when that was ready to, to go, but um, we watched this all being built. It was really amazing. Mm. Very cool. Thank you, Pam. I'm gonna, let me share real quick. I'll start out uh, with the first video. I'm gonna share my screen and um, uh, share the Stearns room in action um, for those who may not have seen this room before. So that was the Stern's room. And if anyone would like to share sort of more general stories or, or specifically about the Stern room, El, um, Everett, do you want to go? Do you have to un unmute? Uh, there you okay. go. Um, just one first thing that comes to my mind, and it's more recent, is when um, Johanna used to um, bring the um, refugees into that room through the Lutheran services. And I always remember that she, she was dedicated to, to teaching the, the, every, uh, I forgot what day it was, but she would finish teaching them. And then she would march them out of the church down Main Street and teach them all, this, all the things at the stores and everything and march them back to, to, the, um, to the Stearns room. 
and it, it just always impressed me that um, uh, that, that room, and that's what my memories are for teaching the refugees in that room. Mm, absolutely. And she was very good at it, too. <laughs> yes, yes, she was. <laughs> Sheila, go ahead. Oh, you're muted, Sheila. So I was thinking of a few things. Um, certainly from a Sunday school perspective, although that was, was not usually a Sunday school, although we might have drawn the, the divider at times when the Sunday school was larger, but I remember it being a place where when children were excused from Sunday school, uh, from church and coming into Sunday school, all ages would gather in the Stearns room. We'd kind of um, gather in a semicircle, kind of have a worship center, you know, where we'd, you know, uh, just bring all the ages together. And then they went to their separate classes, but it was a time of of fellowship for the whole Sunday school, which we offered up until grade 10 at the time. I remember teaching from, you know, the smallest children to age 10, but um, uh, to 10th grade, excuse me. So I, I had that memory from Sunday school, but also um, other things I recall being done there, the Advent workshop every year when we used to make our individual Christmas tree ornaments, uh, they weren't the permanent chrismons we use today, but um, every year we'd gather uh, and make symbols of the Advent readings of that particular year and there would be a crafting table set up there and the church would come on a Saturday all the adults it wasn't just children but although children were also involved but many adults came and take part in that and Don Jennings our pastor would make homemade ice cream which we'd all enjoy at the end of the, the time together the Saturday before the first Sunday of Advent. There were also other times that we had a very meaningful uh, gatherings there. I, one I remember in particular was um, um, a time after church where it was called Bridges Across Generations where uh, some of the older members of our church uh, shared with the children what their faith meant to them and a little bit about um, their spiritual and faith journey. It was very moving. I can still remember Walt's suite for many of those who know Walt. Um, he was just a wonderful man and uh, he just spoke so plain spoken to the children but he had such an impact on them and I just remember that program Bridges Across Generations was a really very meaningful time for my children to take part in that uh, particular offering. Mm -hmm. um, and just in regard to the church fair, it usually was a food room because that was the room that brought <laughs> so much, um, uh, so many donations. And that was the large um, room in the church fair was for the food. Um, I do remember, and it's kind of getting out of the stern room a little bit, but my daughter, Karen, when she was little, used to love the work at the church fair and she really wasn't old enough to you know take money but Joan Wigan would have her work in the toy room and I can remember her wanting to do her Christmas shopping in what we call grandma's attic it was before it was grandma's basement it was grandma's attic on that wing and her doing her Christmas shopping there and she was always excited about having these little surprises that she bought for the family so just good memories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much Sheila. Yeah you're welcome. Other memories, particularly about the Stearns room that folks would like to share? And if not, and again, we can, this is flow. I'm just going to keep, you know, showing pictures and, and videos as we move on. So I just thought of one other thing, and I'm sorry, I meant sure. to mention that because I think it was such an important change for our church. Mm -hmm. um, oh, a few um, years ago, we, we began the safer space training for, and it really changed the way we did Sunday school that teaches, there had to be two teachers in every room. They had to be always a second person in any situation to keep our you know, children, you know, safe and keep, um, just to know that we are, were educating our, our um, people about the importance of that, that we needed to recognize, not just taking for granted, you know, that, um, that that was okay, that we needed to be able to, um, and that was, uh, you know, it was sensitive training that had to be done for the adults in that, in that program. And that took place in the Stearns room as well. We listened to um, the videos and learned how to, you know, keep everybody safe. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. um, Eleanor, you had your hand up? Uh, um, well, I remember many nights, many Tuesday nights that the Tuesday night social club that also sang would meet in the Stearns room and we, yeah. it was always a nice time of fellowship, but also mm -hmm. uh, learned a lot about music. Um, I don't know whether Bill Mativia ever thought he could teach us about um, what's the, the syncopation. Syncopation, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he tried so hard. 
<laughs> so, but there were many fun memories. And I remember also um, going into that room and, and enjoying seeing the um, pictures and so forth that uh, the instructor for English as a second language had mm -hmm. in the room. If you could see what, what they were, what they were learning. So many happy memories about that room. Absolutely. Thank you, Eleanor. Pam, did you have something you want to share? Well, I, I just, for a long time, I taught Sunday school from eighth grade until I left um, a, after being CE director. And um, we did many youth group events there before we had a room upstairs. And um, there's just so many things. And the last thing, actually, my last experience there was, uh, it was set up as a private room for my daughter's wedding party to have refreshments mm -hmm. before we moved on. So yeah, so many memories. And I, I didn't know um, the young man who the room was named after, but I did know his parents and how meaningful it was. It was such a joy for them to have that room named after him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Pam. I'm gonna switch to the next room and I'm just sort of um, moving down the hallway, as it were, uh, there it is. or oh, over first. So this is the ready room and I'm going to share my screen again. Just a moment. Here we go. So um, stories particularly about this room, or again, if folks come up with other ones that you've uh, thought of, um, um, Edna, and then um, Everett, go ahead, Edna. Um, did, am I misremembering this? Eleanor could correct me, but I think we did art projects with the kids in this room, yes or no? I taught Sunday school, believe it or not, some a hundred years ago with the kids. Yeah, and did, we, did we do it in there, Eleanor? And Eleanor is currently muted. There you go. Yep. Yes. And, and uh, actually that room has known many uh, uses from uh, a, a Sunday school class to a nursery. And then more recently, it's been used for family promise and for the cold weather shelter too. Ah, yes. So yes. many uses. Yes. Yes. I I remember doing the art projects with the kids. I love doing that actually. Yeah. Mm. That's where I felt especially competent. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. That anyway. and Christmas pageants. <laughs> yes. Yes. Christmas I miss that us. greatly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Everett, and then Sarah, and then Tim. So Everett, you're next. You have to unmute again. Yeah, um, that that probably is one of the most sacred rooms in the education wing to me. 
Um, I can remember the, um, the um, cribs lined up in that room, but most of all, I remember the most dedicated um, nursery person in that, in that wing was Lorraine Brown. She was so dedicated to those to those to that nursery, and and to me, I that that's a, a lasting impression of that room to me is seeing Lorraine in that room. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Everett. Sarah. Yeah, I I worked with Lorraine, and I worked with uh, Mrs. Jennings, uh, helping out in the nursery. The first time I went into the nursery was when my daughter Christine was baptized and I had to take her out of the chap the, out, out of the sanctuary after she was baptized because she was raising such a ruckus. So I took her back to the nursery and uh, that was when Mrs. Jennings was there. And I remember uh, letting Christine play on the floor and I ended up reading uh, uh, a Sesame Street book to a little boy who was very upset at being in the nursery, but he was very happy to be read Sesame Street. And I sat there the, the rest of the time reading the Sesame Street book over and over and over ad nauseum, but it, it, it kept him happy. And um, I remember bringing my daughter Victoria there for the first time and they asked how old she was and she was two weeks and they were kind of taken aback at, uh, they were used to months and years, but not weeks. And uh, as I said, I did work help in the nursery a lot. Um, I also remember the church fair, we had the, the book room there and helping Carol Parker set up all the books and uh, uh, <laughs> Gain quite a, a huge turnout of, of donations and then people buying books. But uh, Carol Parker did an awful lot to, and I helped out in the, the fair with that. So a lot of memories in that room. Hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Tim? Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things I honor about our congregation from when I first came in 78 is that whatever our congregation has done we've done it with care and um, seriousness and love uh, and I think this room is what was one example of that um, you know when the church decided to uh, add a, a, a paid person uh, to be in there um, to help to um, anchor that room uh, it was a, a sign of that. And uh, I know um, leaving Tyler in there when he was weeks, <laughs> um, you always felt confident about it. And uh, it, it was a, just a way of uh, that first church has always shown its love is by taking care with whatever it does. The same that Sheila was saying about the safe, safer spaces um, mm -hmm. idea when that came out and whatever curricula were chosen and so forth. The other thing is uh, briefly the choir also um, practiced in this room as well. So I remember, hmm. I remember that. Yeah. Um, Linda Sims and then Pam. Um, I, I remember the choir in there and the Stearns room and upstairs in chapel and uh, guild room. And I'm not sure, but I think we probably also rehearsed at some point upstairs. in the assembly room, but yes, the, in, the, uh, in the music room upstairs. What I was going to remember, what I was remembering though, um, was when we first went to First Church, one of the things that I learned um, kind of quietly, it was something that was not spoken of regularly, but there was a young girl um, whose parents belonged to the congregation who were involved in worship and um, enjoyed being at worship. And this girl um, had some severe difficulties and was not able to be part of the regular church school or be able to sit through a church service. And there was a man who stood up and said, I will take care of this girl so her parents can be um, involved in church. And that was something that touched me so 
deeply that this one person, this one girl could be cared for and kept safe um, by this very caring man. And that still impresses me when I think about that. Mm. Thank you, Linda. Or you may know the rest of the story. Mm. Pam, do you wanna share? Yeah, I, um, I taught in this room kindergarten before it became the nursery and I was chair of the CE committee and Tim was right. We um, put a huge amount of thought following the state guidelines for daycares uh, to make sure that we had everything just right in that room. And then um, years later, when I had my daughter, I don't know if you remember this, Sheila, but um, you had made little cloth covered lollipops to give out as ornaments. Um, remember that? That year, <laughs> remember that? We still, to this I, day. I think, put, that's, that's it, I, I can, yes. I, so you gave Kate one uh, when she was in the nursery and we still put that on the tree oh every year. <laughs> yep. It, we, I don't even know if there's real, a real lollipop under the cloth or not, but, but it has survived all these years. Oh, that's a great yeah. story. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And, and then um, my daughter was old enough to teach Sunday school and I was a uh, CE director at the time and I did not want this teenager um, it, to be in that classroom with um, the kindergartners alone. So Pam, oh shoot, begins Wood. Wood, 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 Woodward. Woodward. Yes, yes, Pam Woodward came out to find me afterwards and said, I want this kid in my program at Concord High. And she so totally influenced Kate's future um, that she's a special ed teacher. And, and, it, and it was in a great deal of response to Pam seeing her as a natural teacher. Mm. So it's, it's, it's meant a lot to yeah. our family. Thank you. I'm going to shift us gently into the Riley room that you can now see behind me. I'm going to share my screen to show the short video of this room. So that's the Riley room. Go ahead, um, uh, Everett. <laughs> that, if I'm not mistaken, that was the last um, Sunday school class taught was in that room. And she's right down underneath you. And that was Sheila who taught that class. Mm -hmm. and, and Skylar and Lily were in that class. I remember that going in there quite often. But that mm -hmm. was the last Sunday school class in that wing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Everett. Others, um, Sarah? And Sheila, who, yeah, sorry, I was <laughs> switching screens on me, sorry. I guess, um, I, I'm, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> I remember uh, helping Harriet, uh, Harriet Bailey um, 
I was the assistant and she was the Sunday school teacher and it was uh, Pentecost Sunday and my job was a noise maker. So she read the, the reading and I was to make noise at the appropriate time. So I had uh, fun and actually wore myself out making all this noise with noise makers. I'm not sure the kids were in, uh, learned much from it or had fun, but I had fun that Sunday. And I do remember taking my kids uh, to that room for their Sunday school lesson. Thank you, Sarah. Sheila. Um, just seeing the Sunday school room, just so many memories over the years of being a Sunday school teacher. And for a time, my children were really young until it, uh, we closed it, the Sunday school in a couple, two, three years ago. But um, I also just wanted to mention Ed Riley's name is on that door. And I remember Ed so much as the Sunday school superintendent coming in each of the Sunday school rooms and taking attendance and picking up the offering envelopes from the teacher. But also another gentleman who I just <laughs> loved. Ed LaFrance, and he was a Sunday school <laughs> superintendent as well. And he'd always come into each class. He didn't want to be disruptive to what the teacher was doing, but he'd give the, um, the sign of, I love you every day to the kid. He'd walk in and you know do the hands uh, signing, I love you to the children as he picked up the um, attendance records and, and whatnot. So I just wanted to mention those as well as Harriet Bailey and so many of the other, Walt Sweet, so many other teachers that you know helped me um, mentored me as a teacher, you know, in my early years as a young mother and um, and then towards the end, you know, down to just one Sunday school class, it was a multi-age class. And I, again, I so remember Skylar and Lily and uh, the joy they brought uh, to my Sunday mornings. They were wonderful young ladies um, as we wrapped up our Sunday school years, but just a lot of, a lot of emotion around those Sunday school rooms. There's a number of children over the years that, um, you know, Began their journey, their faith journeys in those rooms. And I just had a question. I think it was under Sarah Green that we painted the murals on those walls. Um, do you recall, Eleanor, if that's when that happened? Those like the palm tree in the desert and the things that are painted on the walls. It was such a, um, a nice, there were very biblical scenes that were painted on the walls. And yes, I there, Sarah, yeah, Sarah Green did Sarah those. Green. Yeah, yeah that, Sarah Green. so yeah. nice. Yeah. I, I was remembering when I, I was teaching Sunday school and we were doing the, uh, we were going to do the Passover dinner and uh, we started and in those rooms and we paraded through Jerusalem to find the upper room where, <clears throat> where we had a Passover dinner <laughs> with the children. Cool. It, was, it was great fun. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed it very much. That's lovely. Thank you. Yeah, Pam. Um, back in the early 70s, um, the, Linda referred to a young woman who needed to have a one-on-one -on -one person. I had her oldest brother, and um, I ended up teaching that same grade, and my brother was in that class as well, all the way through because nobody else would teach, and I taught in that room for, gosh, 10 years. Um, so pretty close to 10 years with that class there. And I'm so glad it got painted. <laughs> I'm going to gently shift us into the final room I have a photo picture of. And unfortunately, this room is sort of uh, representing all kinds of rooms. This room and the room next to it, which were for many years the bell choir room, but also the food pantry rooms, which I didn't take a video of for security reasons, because I did this in November. Um, so, but there was storage of the food in this room uh, near the end. So I'm going to sh share the, the brief uh, video of this room as well. And then we can finish the uh, reflections. Mm -hmm. Is this the room we come in? And, and here we go.
zoomed in on the bulletin board in that room because the bulletin board still had all um, photos and comics and certificates from the bell choir um, on that bulletin board. So uh, yeah, Tim. I guess uh, seeing the remnants of the shelter in there, of the uh, food pantry in there, um, just connects for me to all the memories that still live on in our going forward desire to minister to the community um, of both the shelter starting in there, the cold weather shelter starting in the, in the whole education wing, and, and uh, of course the food pantry and uh, how, what a gift that has been to us as a congregation, I think, to have those, to have that become an integrated part of our identity as a congregation. Mm -hmm. And this, this room used to be the social room in the um, emergency yes. uh, homeless shelter. Yeah. Okay. So there was a couch and a TV. Right. And it was a small social room, but it was a social room nevertheless. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Thank Watch you, some Bill. movies in there. A lot of movies. <laughs> same, old, same old movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Sheila and then Edna. Oh, Sheila, you're currently muted. <laughs> Along those same lines that Tim spoke and Carol spoke of, um, back to the nursery room uh, where family promise would always meet for their supper meal. And we brought, as we brought meals in for that and sat and had supper with those families, um, it was very moving to be part of that ministry and certainly want to recognize um, Terry Blake and Carol Blake for their, you know, leadership in that family promise program. And it's been such a worthwhile uh, ministry um, to have taken part of, but many fellowship suppers with those families around the table in that nursery room, and uh, mm -hmm. so grateful that our church, you know, has supported that ministry over the last several years. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you, Sheila. Edna? Um, I remember back during the shelter time that um, Dr. Black, Doug Black, does anyone remember him? Yes. He was like the quintessential obstetrician in Concord. And he would volunteer to, you know, make sure everybody, they needed a doctor on. And he would do that on the weekends. It was always very nice to speak to him. And he mm -hmm. always very, was very caring to all the people who had come in. And also mm -hmm. Dr. Black delivered Mason when <laughs> I was almost 45 years old. <laughs> Awesome. So, thank, thank you, you, dear friends. There are many more stories and I'm going to invite everybody to share more during our coffee hour afterwards because it's 11 a.m. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to finish the rest of the service. So please stay after worship and continue conversation at this time. At the moment, I'm going to round out this time of sharing sacred stories um, as we sing together the hymn, Take My Life, Lord, and Let It Be. And I will ask Adele to play through the melody for us first. Wait, sorry. I, well, I was trying to mute everybody else, Adele. <laughs> that was my bad. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Take my 
And as we begin our time of prayer together, I'm going to invite you to join with me in our prayers of intercession. I will read all of the text and I invite you to join me on the bolded print. In lives where love has been born this day, thanks be to you, O oh God. In families where forgiveness has been strong, thanks be to you, O oh God. In nations where wrongs have been addressed, where tenderness has been cherished, and where visions of Earth's oneness have been served, thanks be to you, O oh God. May those who are weary find rest today. Lord, hear our prayer. May those who carry great burdens for their people find strength in you. Lord, hear our prayer. May the midwives of new beginnings in our world find hope in all they do. Lord, hear our prayer. And may the least among us find strength in our souls, worth in our words, and love in our living. Amen. O brother Jesus, who wept at the death of a friend and overturned tables in anger at wrong, let us not be frightened by the depths of passion. Rather, let us learn the love and anger and wild expanses of our soul within us that are true expressions of your grace and wisdom. Assure us again that in becoming more like you, we come closer to our true selves, made in the image of outpouring love and born of the free eternal wind. Dear friends, let us join together in sharing the Lord's Prayer as is printed in the bulletin. O oh, Birther, Father, Mother of the cosmos, focus your light within us, make it useful. Create your reign of unity now through our fiery hearts and willing hands. Help us love beyond our ideals and sprout acts of compassion for all creatures. Animate the earth within us. We then feel the wisdom underneath supporting all. Untangle the knots within so that we can mend our hearts' simple ties to each other. Don't let surface things delude us, but free us from what holds us back from our true purpose. Out of you, the astonishing fire, returning light and sound to the cosmos. And let us take a moment to set our intentions for the week ahead or the day ahead, or depending on where your heart is, even just the hour ahead. And I invite you now to join with me in our closing hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Adele, when you are ready. Okay. 
can fear it. Save me by your grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others you are calling, do not pass me by. Be the spring of all my comfort more than life to me not just here on earth beside me but eternally savior savior hear my humble cry while on others you are calling do not pass me And let us join together in our responsive benediction and sending. You wept at the death of a friend, O Christ. You showed sorrow at the suffering of others. As our time of worship comes to a close, grant us the strength to express sadness and the confidence to call forth new life. Open our eyes to see every family as part of one family. Open our lips to speak words of hope. Amen. And we close our service of worship with our postlude. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adele, and thank you all for joining this morning in worship.